Howdy folks and welcome back to the JPS podcast and really cool episode today with none other than Lyle McDonald and in today's episode we talk all about mechanical tension, uh, volume versus intensity for hypertrophy. So really good discussion based on Lyle's three-part series on mechanical tension on bodyrecomposition.com. And I'm sure many of you will benefit a lot from this episode if you're wanting to improve your understanding of what we need to do at a physiological level and in an applied sense uh, to build muscle. Before we get into the episode, a few housekeeping things. For those of you who are coaches, soon to be coaches, looking to get into the industry and want to accelerate and fast track the learning process to improve your knowledge and understanding of everything pertaining to coaching, the JPS Online Mentorship course for personal trainers starts the 2nd of September. So this is our second intake of our online course. In our first intake, we had over 80 coaches and by golly, I'm correcting the exams now and I am extremely impressed at how far the coaches who have completed the course have developed uh, in the last six months. So uh, very pleasing to see. And to give you some information about the course, it's uh, designed to be 12 weeks, but you do have six weeks to complete the course. Uh, That's including the assessments and the three-part exam that is quite uh, detailed and thorough and will challenge and test your knowledge and practical skills, more importantly. Uh, The course includes 12 modules, and within the 12 modules, we have over 40 hours of lectures from the likes of Danny Lennon, James Krieger, Mike Isratel, the Revive Stronger guys, Brian Miner, and Jake Lenarden of Break Binge Eating, and plenty of other experts and leaders in the industry to give you guys a truly evidence-based experience. Not only do you get access to the course curriculum, but there's a huge amount of additional resources uh, with our physique course, which is a full-blown course teaching you how to coach physique athletes. We have a corrective exercise and teaching movement course. We also give our students access to the 3DMJ lifting library, access to the ultimate evidence-based conference video lectures from both 2018 and 2019, as well as a free mass subscription and monthly Q&As, as well as uh, many of our templates and other resources. Not only that, uh, if you're a mentorship student, you get all of our supplementary and additional courses that we add uh, to our library over the course of uh, the years for free. So we will continue to educate you long beyond your studies. So if you're interested, uh, enrollment is closing at the end of August 2019. So do click the link below uh, to check it out. Um, And if you have questions, feel free to email me. Uh, Also, JPS is holding the first inaugural Australian Powerlifting Summit at JPS on the 16th and 17th of November. We have, over the two days, some of the best coaches and athletes uh, from Australia presenting on all things powerlifting, including the man, the myth, the legend, Robert Wilkes. So if you're interested in that, do click the link uh, in the description box and grab a ticket before they run out. And finally, uh, our online coaching systems have seen a revamp and we are bringing on a number of our in-house JPS coaches to work with more online clients. And we're opening up some positions for new clients and athletes uh, who want to work with us. And we're also bringing on board the people-punching Peacock Triple P Jackson Pios Uh, to work with our team and uh, coach online. So if you wanna work with our coaching staff from wherever you are located, if that's not within a decent or practical proximity to our Airport West facility here in Melbourne, and you wanna work with a coach who has actually worked with real people and knows how to get results uh, and understands the coaching process um, in the flesh as well as online, uh, we can certainly help you out. So whether you wanna compete in powerlifting, bodybuilding, improve your physique, You might want to lose some fat or simply find a more effective way to achieve your goals and have the support, guidance, and accountability of a coach. We can definitely help you out and details are in the description box also. So, long-winded intro. I apologize for not being consistent with the podcast. I have been super busy traveling, presenting, working on a lot of projects such as the contest prep ebook, which we've released with Revive Stronger. Uh, that was an absolute monster of an endeavor. Uh, thank you all for uh, purchasing that book. Those of you who have, 
Uh, it's over 150 pages, and the feedback we've received so far has been phenomenal. Uh, so yeah, if you want to check that out, I will link that in the description box also. So description box, that's where it's at. Uh, but without further ado, here is the interview with Lyle McDonald. Only because I won't shut up. Uh, and I do love hearing my own voice. So right. You've been doing well anyway? Yeah, everything's fine. I'm getting, you know, next and I'm aggressively not writing. So that's always really good. Um, I, I know, I know when I start cleaning the house that I'm really avoiding work. So hmm. I'm still a little exhausted from the woman's book. Um, yeah, I bet. And that article to... would have, uh, I, I guess that would have been a, a fun piece to write because it was very much a summation of like all your thoughts and ideas and that's kind yeah. of like enjoyable, right? And it's, oh yeah, I, I, I had this weird thing that if I'm getting paid for it, it's work and I don't like to do it. But if it's yep. just like on the website and I'm not getting, not going to make any money, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Um, it's also kind of a background and we can touch on some of this stuff, like extra, you know, other topics I want to address, like exercise selection. I'm going to talk about training to failure and sort of these are all, you know, and it, I kind of made short comments in, mm. in that series. Like one thing I think is worth addressing because you, you put up that quote of mine. Um, you know, the fact that bodybuilders and powerlifters have traditionally used different techniques. Get to right? the bodybuilders, for the most part. What's that? They get to a similar point for the most part. They, they do, but it's, you know, bodybuilders have always sort of tried to maximize tension at the lightest loads, whereas powerlifters have tried to minimize tension mm -hmm. for the heaviest loads through efficiency training. And like, while I'm big on, you know, the whole power building thing and the crossover, I do think when you look at the specialization, there are differences that people forget. You know, we could even, yeah. if you want to really yeah. piss people off, you've been following <laughs> that whole, yes, that guy I who said have. deadlifts are not, not a good exercise. It's yeah. got everybody because nothing pisses off hard heads more Lyle, than hearing. I, I put up a exercise. video three years ago saying why I'm ditching the deadlift. It's, yeah, I, I've been meaning to write a series that's going to come next. I'm going to call it Hypertrophy cool. Heresy. Basically, here's why all the exercises you think are good are shit. And it'll, I mean, like, they work for some people, and that's the problem. Yes, that people the they problem. work for, like, Franco was a great deadlifter. He was, like, 5'6 and built yeah. a deadlift. Yeah. And guys that are built to squat, and everybody else are just, you know, overhead pressing is a shit movement. Deadlifts, it's, and we can address that. Average. Where, where is the tension? What is, you know, what, what, is, what is being trained? And it's like, you can say, well, everything. But by definition, that means it is training nothing. <laughs> that's right? That's a very good point. That is a very good point. I think that's a good segue um, yeah. into uh, the conversation at hand today. So uh, yeah. for those listening, Lyle wrote a monster three-part series on mechanical tension and hypertrophy. Very detailed, informative, humorous, as per Lyle's usual musings on <laughs> bodyrecomposition.com. And the, yeah, didn't stop attention, covered a lot of different areas, uh, which was very, very cool. Uh, so first, Lyle, uh, brief, quick rundown of how muscles work, because this is how you uh, framed the idea of tension. Right. Um, and I think it's important for us to know. Uh, you don't have to go into too much detail, because I want to get sure. into the good stuff about tension, but how do muscles work? Okay. Uh, well, depending on the person, you know, from very well to very poorly, just kind of depending on the lifter. No. Okay. So if we're talking about, you know, active muscle contractions, like not reflexes, not things that are, you know, uh, the brain sends a signal, travels down motor nerves, gets to what's called the neuromuscular junction. That's where the nerve terminal hits the muscle. Uh, a bunch of stuff that you could just consider magic happens because the details are not really that important and the muscle contracts. Right? That's kind of the, 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 the base, uh, base of it, right? And you can think of a, a skeletal muscle. You know, we've got tendons at either end, which attach the muscle to the bone. And then you've got muscle fibers running in between it, kind of. People tend to think of it as running end to end, right? So you picture like a bicep, right? There's a bicep tendon and the tendon at the elbow and this muscle. But it's not really true. Fibers don't run from one end to the other. And this gets into the whole myonuclear domain thing and blah, 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 blah. And it, what, what we end up finding is that there are just overlapping muscle fibers of different mm -hmm. lengths that kind of run along the whole thing. Now, when I went to college back in the uh, dark ages, which was 1993 when I graduated, pretty much that was the model. We had muscle fibers. We had a tendon. Nervous system caused them to fire. Magic happens. Contraction. Mm -hmm. Right? Jump forward about a decade when I, I took an advanced exercise physiology class. The entire model had changed. And what we now found out was that all the muscle fibers, everything was connected to everything. 
right? And they found all these little protein stuff like titan, which I've been talking about. I, that's going to be, just watch. 10 years from now, mm. it's all going to be, adaptations in titan are going to be a key aspect of muscle stiffness and long-term and all this other stuff. Yep. Desmond, all these little fibers. So like muscle fibers that they thought were just overlapped are connected with little mm. itty bitty fiber things. And like this was a big finding. So you have like a fiber here, fiber here, and a fiber here. And you can totally damage this fiber. And you still get the same force output mm -hmm. because this fiber contracting and this fiber contracting pull on that broke damaged fiber by these little connect pieces of connective tissue. So like the whole model got way, way, way more complicated. And where this kind of ties into the, the, the hypertrophy question, right, is they knew back in the 70s that tension was the initiator. That's what turned on hypertrophy both active tension, so what happens when we exercise or lift weight, and passive tension, right? All those weird, you know, animal stretching models. Non-energetic right? uh, components. Yeah. Um, you know, basically they hang a weight off of a bird's arm, and by, by stretching it, it creates passive tension. And it doesn't work in humans, by the way. They, they'd even, there, there was a study they did years ago, and they had people hold like a calf stretch for like four straight minutes nothing like it only happens if you take a quail and do 24 7 so we're really we're really uh concerned with active tension right so they knew that active tension was turning on hypertrophy somehow they don't really know how um and this was his back in 1975 mm -hmm. so then for decades and i used i heard people online for years about this we don't really know what causes muscle growth well actually yeah we do <laughs> and we've actually known for about four decades in terms of what the trigger is mm -hmm. which is generating high tension forces in the muscle it would be not it wouldn't be till much later that we figured out you know mechanistically and i forget when they started talking about like mtor and like i've got i was writing back about like mpk and mtor mm -hmm. over a decade ago back when that was kind of a new thing and we knew that that was really the key and amino acids leucine activated mtor and training activated mtor and that kind of turned on protein synthesis but nobody knew how um, and, and with that, yeah, there are all these hypotheses of muscle growth. There's an energetic, the muscle damage theory, which is still floating around. And if anything, damage is a negative for growth, right? Damas did that paper. And in the first three weeks when damage was the greatest, mm -hmm. growth was the smallest. And it wasn't until the damage stopped. So this, this whole chasing soreness, chasing damage thing is completely flawed. You want, and, and I, I wrote an article about that years ago, stop chasing doms. And I pointed out that Soreness is the most in the early part of the training cycle. Growth is the greatest at the end, right? Mm -hmm. Soreness is a detriment. So this whole breakdown muscle to build, that doesn't work. And energetics, and some people thought it was too much blood, and other people thought it was you know, hypoxia and BFR and then cell swelling. There are all these different – and, and they, they may be playing a secondary role. Make no mistake. Mm -hmm. But really, we knew that it was active tension. And the question then became, how does a – mechanical what is ultimately mechanical right now I many muscle fibers are filing biochemically and but how is that mechanical stress that mechanical tension right because passive tension stretching doesn't there's process. no biochemistry or work how mm. does that translate into activating the mTOR pathway mm. and as i told this story in the article and i'll briefly go into the story i heard was that the physiologist called in the bioengineers and said what the hell is going on and i said well you know if the muscle fibers were attached to these other structures in the cell, ribosomes and just the general cell structure, well, that would give you a way for those muscle contractions to, to send a cell. And I, I'm reasonably sure the physiologist went, right. Mm -hmm. And then they looked and they were like, huh, they Oops. were right. <laughs> and that's where you get into that whole thing with Desmond and Titan and, and there's one called an Integrin. And basically, we, they developed this idea of the mechanosensor. And it's just this structure within muscle fibers and then in bone too and others that sense tension. And when it senses a high tension, it at, works through something called focal adhesion kinase, which has a phosphatidic acid pathway and the supplements, remember a couple of years ago, and then that activates mTOR. So boom, we can translate a mechanical process into growth. And that's, again, there are other factors, make no mistake, but that is the initi primary initiating factor awesome. is a high tension contraction of the muscle. Cool. And what is causing that high tension uh, contraction? I guess that's the, uh, the next question that sort of stems from that you addressed in the article. Um, right. How do we get that uh, mechanical? 
Right. And what it comes down to is force requirements, mm -hmm. right? So, so very simplistically, right, we've got two primary fiber types. We've got type 1 fibers, slow twitch. They're your endurance fibers, smaller, very aerobic, uh, very efficient, don't generate a lot of waste products. We've got your type 2 fibers that are bigger, contract a tiny bit faster, more growth potential, more anaerobic. And there's all these sub fibers and there's 2, 2A, 2X, 2AX. There's some hybrids. Doesn't matter. For our purposes, we've got 1 and 2 right? Slow twitch, fast twitch. And we know that, and they've known this for decades, something called Henneman's size principle, which says that as that fibers are recruited in an orderly fashion from smallest to largest based on force requirements, right? So you start walking, very low force. Your body uses type one fibers, very efficient, very aerobic. So you never get tired. You get bored, right? Now we start jogging, higher force outputs. We get more fibers, probably not a lot of top two, the type two fibers at that point, still type one, right? You can jog again for a pretty extended period of time if the pace is slow enough. Right now we start running harder. You'll start recruiting type two muscle fibers. Now some type two fibers are still very aerobic, right? I don't want people to think of it as one and two. It's a continuum from the smallest and the most aerobic to like the biggest and, the, and everything's in between. So as force requirements go up, the body will start bringing in more and more fibers, right? So we go to running. Now we're running hard, the highest pace we could do for an hour. It hurts. If you ever ridden a bike for like the max, you're a bodybuilder, you don't do that crap. But like endurance athletes, no, this hurts. You can do it, right? You're at a point, what's called the maximal lactate state, different names for it, that basically the amount of waste that's being produced, your body can deal with. Mm -hmm. It hurts, but you can sustain it for about an hour or until you give up. And as soon as you go above that, you start recruiting more and more and more type 2 fibers. You get more waste products being generated, and fatigue happens very quickly, right? Now, so again, from low to high, you know, as and, and that's a recruitment issue, right? That is the actual fiber being brought into play. So if all you ever did was went and walked for an hour, you would use pretty much your slow twitch fibers only. They would be exposed to, I mean, a, a stimulus, but it would be an aerobic, like very low tension, be an aerobic stimulus, right? A high tension stimulus requires that the fibers be recruited and required to output a high force. And there's kind of two ways to get here. One is to go at a high intensity, right? So if you go out and run a hundred meter sprint or do a 90 second or 30 second interval on a bike, that requires very high force outputs that will require a, a large majority of your fibers, if not all of them, depending, and you'll fatigue very quickly, but that is a high tension stimulus. Obviously, in the weight room, we do it with weight training. Like I said, there's kind of, well, let me back up. The other way to get there is to work at a moderately high intensity for extended periods, mm. right? So you're, whatever, you're working at, you know, a little bit less than your maximum hour bike pace. Some fibers are going to get fatigued and the body will drop those out and it will bring in new fibers to try to maintain force output. And it will do this until the point that you, it can't generate force and that's when you fatigue right? Suddenly you can't hold 20 miles an hour. You can hold 19. And this is something I'll address in another article series I'm writing. This doesn't mean the muscle's exhausted, right? True exhaustion would mean you can't move, mm -hmm. right? When you see those, the videos of the marathoners who collapse and are just like, that's muscular exhaustion. Zombie apocalypse type shit. Basically, yeah. And in animal models, like animal models are vicious, right? They put a right. mouse on a treadmill, the shock plate in the back. And when the mouse gets tired, hits the shock plate, he goes. When the mouse lies on the shock plate without moving, that's exhaustion. Mm. Or they dump him in a thing of water, and when the mouse stops swimming for survival, that's muscular exhaustion, right? We don't hit, we fatigue, mm -hmm. right? We don't generally go to true exhaustion. It can happen, especially not in the weight room, right? That would entail going, taking a set to failure, drop setting, drop setting, drop setting. When you could lift zero pounds, that would be exhaustion. We don't do that. Jerry Telly actually had a drop set like that, but nobody knows who he is uh, way back in the day. So anyway, so you can go at a moderately high intensity for extended periods, and eventually you will sort of get stair-stepped recruitment, or you can go to high intensity for short periods. Mm -hmm. And we know that in terms of muscular recruitment, right, the body actually making the fibers fire, you'll hit maximal re recruitment somewhere between 80 and 90% of in the, in the lab, these is called maximal voluntary isometric contraction, right? So they have them against like an isometric thing and it's just like 
ooh, pull as hard as possible. It's a little different in dynamic movements, but it's close enough, right? So I'll use that one rep maximum. It's close enough. Mm-hmm. And at about that range, you will get a full muscle fiber recruitment. Okay, now someone will ask, but what happens beyond that? Right, if all your fibers are recruited 85%, how do we generate more force? Right, 85% is about five reps mm-hmm. or so. And the reason there's something called rate coding, it's the rate at which the brain sends signals down the nerve, that goes up. Um, not really relevant here. So, so what we're looking at is if you were to take a weight, if you take a five rep max weight or a three or an eight, somewhere in that range, you will get 100% fiber recruitment from the first repetition. Quick, and, and this is addressed in the series. There's this idea floating around that we can only recruit 30% of all our muscle. I don't know where this came from. I do know where it came from, but it doesn't matter. And it's not true. Even beginners can recruit like 100% of their triceps. Mm-hmm. We can all, most people can only recruit like 90% of their legs, their, their quad mm-hmm. muscles. And I don't know why. I have volume with leg training. Right? I think that that's my best speculation for yeah. why that might be, you know, if you need, if you're not getting, if, if you've got 10% of fibers that aren't recruited, even at the maximal intensity, I do think that's probably part of why legs may need a little bit more volume. So, so yeah, so at 85, so you take a five rep weight and 85% of max, you'll get full recruitment from rep one and you'll hit failure at rep five, assuming you do five repetitions. Um, eight is going to be close, a triple definitely. Mm-hmm. Now, but like I said, you can also get to full recruitment lifting less than maximal weights to fatigue, right? So if you take a 15 rep max weight, and that might be 75%, at some point in the set, you'll get full recruitment, right? And there's been a couple of studies. I cited them in the article series, and, and, and they always do these weird, it was like, okay, they compared a 3RM, 90% in the leg press, to like 75%. And they actually got eight reps at 90%, which on the leg press, you can do that, right? You have a little bit of a rebound. Squats, not so much. No. And the 75% got like 18 reps, right? So it's a 10 rep differential. And there's a whole bunch of nonsense with peak and average EMG and all this other stuff. But what happened was that the final eight reps of the 18 rep set showed the same overall activation as the eight reps of the the 90% set. Right. So you had, you know, and depending on how you want to look at it, you can either get to full recruitment doing 18 reps to failure, but you're basically wasting 10 reps to get there. Wasting. Right. Another study they did in older women with tubing because it's a three rep max. And I don't know how you do a three rep max with tubing lateral raises, to be quite honest, but they did it compared to like a 15 RM. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that the three rep max got full recruitment from the first rep, as we would expect. The 15 rep max, it was like the last three to five reps. So somewhere between 10 and 12, right? Now the low load and the blood flow restriction stuff is working through the same mechanism, right? And you gotta realize that 25% of max in the weight room is like not 20% on a treadmill. Like it's not the same as, like it, it's, hard, it's heavy enough, especially if you're looking at like small, you know, leg extensions or arm curls, which we always use. And what you find is that taken to failure, you get the same full recruitment at the very end of the set, right? Because, like, if you do a set of 30 to failure on leg extensions, I mean, A, I don't know why you'd want to, but if you do that, failure is failure is failure, mm-hmm. right? 100% is 100%. And if the muscle, if your body is trying to, ma- to generate as much force as possible mm-hmm. to maintain the set, I mean, assuming you haven't given up. What you, and what you find is what? Those last four or five reps, whether it's a set of 30 or a set of 15, they're about the same speed. Mm-hmm. And that's because the fatigue is essentially the same, right? Mm-hmm. And, and blood flow restriction seems to do it. Something about hypoxia and those seems to increase fiber activation, mm-hmm. right? That's fine. And same thing with low load. And, and that's and where the power- force velocity uh, relationship uh, starts to come in. It's like we need high force outputs at slow right. velocities that turns on the motor units and exposes yeah. them to that high tension stimulus. Exactly. That's exactly the Yeah, exactly way to put it. And, and the sort of the final point and we'll move on that sort of points to the, the failure is required for submaximal sets. Mm-hmm. Well, especially the low load stuff. So what they find is that low load sets to failure, like that 25% for 30 to 35 reps, that painful dicking around people doing gym. Um, if you go to failure, you get essentially the same growth as with heavy, but if you don't go to failure, you don't get the same growth. And that sort of really makes that point that, again, failure is failure is failure, no matter how you get there, for all 
practical you know, now from an efficiency standpoint, yeah. I would personally rather do a heavy set of eight than a heavy set of 35 and stay, you know, I, I will spend three reps to get the five good ones, or you can spend 30 painful reps to get the same five good ones without the bone. You know, I, there are re, there are times for BFR low load joints and yada, yada, yada. But from a purely physiological standpoint, you're farting around for 30 reps to get the five good ones or however many it is, whereas you could just lift a heavier weight mm -hmm. and impress and impress your friends, which is, and look better. Way, look good, uh, way better yeah, for I mean, social media purposes. Exactly. Although BFR looks a little bit edgy, like make no it mistake, that looks pretty cool on Instagram. <laughs> and I would point to anyone who remembers pro wrestling to go look at the Ultimate Warrior. He was a 1980s pro wrestler that always wore uh, ribbons around yes. here, and his arms were the huge. red ones, right? Uh, yeah. So I think yeah. that's proof of concept for BFR. He was doing this. So, so anyway, so those are the two ways to get to a high tension stimulus, cool. right? So that kind of brings us full circle. Awesome. However, right, so this, the question, like, right, so we've got this, right, high tension through the integrins, whatever these things are, activates this enzyme pathway to mTOR. What I have not seen data, and I've looked briefly and talked to a buddy of mine who's big into the, the mTOR stuff, we don't know yet how many high tension contractions are needed. Mm -hmm. This to me is and that's this the is volume the, sort of question. Right. Like, like, what's the optimal volume? It's like we just Correct. don't know how many yes. how many high and, tension reps are right. going to lead to the best growth. And, and I do, and I want to make this point because I think in in my defense of you know high tension overload as the key, I've never said volume wasn't important. There is absolutely a volume component to training. So I remember getting to this argument with some of the, the HST guys about a decade ago, and he was like, all that matters is tension. And I go, no, because then all you'd have to do is a single one rep max and leave the gym, and we know that doesn't work. They've even done research that it doesn't work. There's a couple different studies. One, they did five maximum singles twice a week, and there was zero growth. There was another one, and the group, they were actually testing if, if practicing the test gave you the same strength gains as one of those, and they did a single one rep max every day for like a month, no growth. Mm -hmm. And then another group did like three sets of eight and they got growth, right? So may, do not mishear me. Tension is key, but there is in that, that it is there some number of high tension, full recruitment contraction. What's now be kind of, kind of being called effective reps. Chris Beardsley has written a lot about this. If you follow him. His, Stimulating his pace, reps, effective yeah, reps. Yeah, or have whatever you want to call it. Like these are the reps. reps. I think Berger, Fajol, like they're all, you know. It, it's all the same basic stuff. idea. And the idea is that these are the repetitions that are done under full recruitment. Mm -hmm. maximum tension that are activating this pathway. We don't know how many you need yet. Okay. So and I think when we get some of that data, that will, I think, help us resolve some of these volume arguments in terms yes. of optimum or minimums or maximums. Let's, uh, let's move into that question now, because the primary reason uh, I suspect anyway, that you wrote those articles was <laughs> because uh, you know, the claim primary, uh, volume is a primary driver of hypertrophy and you were right. essentially showing that no it's tension that initiates this process and therefore it is the primary factor and volume is supplementary yes. and it's still important but tension is initially um yes. you know, turning on these pathways of cause growth so yeah um to talk about that further let's um just clarify something so i guess from your articles uh you are demonstrating um, and positing the idea that instead of counting set volume per se, we should be rather counting uh, effective reps um, as a means for determining volume. I, I suspect correct? going forwards, and, and I don't think that was even, I probably stole that from one of Chris's or, you know, comments, but the idea is like, okay, we can count reps, we can count sets, but Obviously, 20 sets of pissing around, which we can see any guy in any gym doing endlessly, is not generating a growth response because they're too high tension, they're too low intensity. Because there's Whereas, a lot of ways to define volume outside of like number of sets. There's total repetitions, yes. there's uh, volume, volume load, load hypertrophic yes. volume load, uh, which was James Krieger's uh, yeah. extension of uh, volume load. But uh, yeah. nonetheless, it seems like this uh, effective reps is now the way that we should start looking at volume. So if we can agree that that's uh, somewhat of yeah. a definition for uh, volume and intensity can be defined as absolute intensity. So one on the bar or relative sure. intensity, which is effort, proximity to failure, RIR, VE, so yes. on and so forth. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I have a hypothetical scenario for you um, that I just want to get your thoughts on because I'd like to know which uh, variable has a greater mm-hmm. uh, effect size uh, on uh, muscle growth in terms of the absolute stimulus uh, that's being achieved. So assuming we have the same exercise, same technique and form, levers, moment arms, torque, yeah, all yeah, those yeah. things that you, you discuss that need to be yes. uh, held pretty constant uh, if we are to pro- progress tension and achieve growth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, two progression schemes, uh, looking at muscle growth acutely. So option one, say we had an increase in number of effective reps with the same tension stimulus. For example, we had a three by five at a hundred for an RP eight, and then we progressed yeah. to four by five at a right. hundred RP eight. So there would be approximately three hypertrophic stimulating effective reps, uh, per set, uh, with an RP right. of eight. So we're moving from nine to 12, um, and assuming you haven't achieved enough growth in uh, that first session to facilitate load progression, for example, or right. a reduction um, in effort with the same load, yeah. that's scenario one versus scenario two, where we increase load and tension per se, given that that's our best proxy for tension, uh, but we don't increase the number of effective reps. So we go from three by five at hundred RP yeah. eight to three by five at one Oh five RP eight. Uh, right. Both achieve this uh, tension <coughs> overload via different pathways, right? So option yeah. one, the volume progression leads to greater exposure to this mechanical tension and right. assuming like recovery, adaptive resources allow yeah. uh, would lead to larger effect size and uh, stimulus achieved. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, in your articles, the acute stimulus uh, for growth is critical. And right. my thoughts were obviously growth occurs uh, and as growth occurs, load progression will be necessary in the first scenario because, you know, bigger muscle will produce more force relative yeah. to size. Over time, yes. Eventually. Um, but acutely, volume would seem to me to play a larger role in growth due to achieving a higher number of effective reps and tension per se uh, than adding weight. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Um, so my first hand-waving response is going to be, don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just don't know because I. Th- this is going to get into one of the, this is speculative in the sense that we still don't know, right? How many total reps, effective reps? Like this has been this argument sort of been going on, you know, for for ages at this point. Is like, and and, and nobody seems to just want to do the systematic data or the systematic research. I think needs to be done, right? In terms of what we need to know is. What is, is there an optimal volume? And it may vary by person, by training status, where a further increase in volume either causes a plateau in the stimulus, causes potentially a decrease, right? There's that concept, conceivable possibility. Or is it, you know, we also know muscle protein breakdown is an issue, right? Is there some crossover point? Like, so let's just talk sets for a second. Let's assume we're comparing, you know, five sets to eight sets and they have the same, you know, basically what you're describing. So you're doing a higher volume of effective reps. Does moving from five sets to eight sets give you a greater protein synthetic stimulus, right? Does it, does it continue to go up? Does it flatten out? Does it go down? Mm-hmm. What about protein breakdown? Does it go up? You know, is there some point where there's a crossover? So in terms of your hypothetical, the question becomes, if we don't, is that three by five, right, with, say, nine effective repetitions, is that, A, we might ask if it's sufficient. Mm. Is that even enough, rep? and we don't know. Is it optimal, right? Because if it's already optimal and adding more reps is not a further growth stimulus, then adding weight is the better choice. But we don't have that answer either. Mm. If going from, if 12 is above the cutover po- crossover point where not only is it not positive but it's negative, then it'll be worse. So I think a lot of it is going to come, like I said, this is going to be a totally, I'm going to talk for 10 minutes to not answer the question because <laughs> I don't know. And I think it really depends on, is your volume optimal to begin with? And 100%. I think if you go- And, and let, let's uh, yeah. sort of take that out of the discussion because this is very speculative. We're looking at more so physiology, not applied because you wouldn't just do three sets and you know, that's sure. it. You do other exercises, you train the muscle more per week. But what I, what I was getting at uh, was- yeah. Do you agree that more effective reps, all else being equal, uh, would lead to a greater effect size on growth than simply just adding load um, to pro- increase the mechanical tension? So the question is more so if we yeah. increase tension acutely versus number of effective reps and exposure, because right. we look at tension in two ways, the magnitude yeah. 
and then the duration of tension, right? Agreed. So magnitude being uh, how much tension and then yeah. how much exposure we have to that tension. So yes. the question is, do you think that exposure to tension uh, would have a larger impact on growth given that we see this, uh, you know, uh, nonlinear relationship with hypertrophy and volume uh, right. that increasing the exposure would have a greater effect size in an acute sense versus just increasing the magnitude of tension. Yeah. And again, I just think it depends on how, where that, how many effective reps you're doing relative to what the max is. Cause like, and, and this is again, getting off topic. If you go back to some of the, like the older progression schemes, and this was usually more strength athletes, but they did this a lot, right? So you start with a heavy weight and you do three by three. And that's a pretty close to max weight. Now, there's a lot of people like, oh, just add reps to the set. And I don't think they realize what that actually means. Mm. One repetition is worth about 2 to 3% on the bar. Right? If you look at the rep percentage relationship, if you couldn't add 2 to 3% weight to the bar, you cannot add a repetition. The idea of going from three, you know, a heavy set of three and going, oh, I'm going to build that up to a heavy set of eight, good luck. <laughs> Like you can do it in high rep and some people just suck at adding reps. Like I've known guys that could it's not. It's more so dependent on the rep range because uh, the relative absolutely. increase from like 15 to 16 reps is a lot smaller. than. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So, but what you'd see them do is they do, they do like three by three heavy. Mm. And then at the next workout, they'd add a single. <laughs> and then they try to get a double. Then they try to add a triple. And then they add a single. And when the time they build up to like six by three, which by definition is the maximum, right? If you were doing three by three and it was limits, and you can now do six by three, by definition, three by three is submaximal. So they would build up gradually, and this could be weeks, and then they would add some weight, drop volume again, and build back up, which is conceptually what I think you're getting at, right? So let's say we start at a moderate volume, three by five, even five by five, right? We have a fixed weight on the bar that's a sufficient acute stimulus. Over the next three to four weeks, even six to eight weeks, maybe we build that up from three by five to five by five or six by five or however. I mean, it, that's, it's harder than people I think realize. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, as you're getting stronger, it shouldn't be too bad, but, but if you're working close to limits, adding a heavy, another heavy mm -hmm. study, you know, so you build up from three by five to six by five, add weight. And, and I think if, if we knew where those, you know, minimum effective range, minimum effective reps, mm -hmm. maximum effective reps and optimum, Yes, I think that could probably work. And acutely, and I know, my, you know Mike Isertel has made this point, I don't necessarily disagree with him, is frequently adding weight, it can be a problem with technique, and I address this in my article. Many people run into this problem, especially on isolation stuff. You add even a small amount of weight, and your form just goes down the toilet, right? Lateral raises are probably one of the most notorious movements mm -hmm. from this. But everything, you know, most, so on top of whatever, you know, connective tissue takes time to progress, et cetera, et cetera. In that sense, acutely, yeah, if you start at a lowish volume that's sufficient acutely and build up to a higher volume that's still recoverable mm -hmm. and then add weight over time, I think that can certainly work. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the way I tend to program is I just sort of start with what I feel is about an optimal volume to begin mm -hmm. with and just keep it there. Like yeah. I just, that's whatever, maybe I'm just lazy. Well. No, no, and, I I think think both, and I think both would probably can get the same end points over time, right? Over time. Yes. And I think that's a lot of it. You know, if you find that whenever you add weight, you're uh, acutely. And, and I remember people years ago saying they found that even staying at the same weight for two workouts to kind of let it, your body, whatever, accept it or whatever, whatever goofy terminology you want to use. Or yeah. <laughs> or whatever, like that allowed them to main, you know, and you see this in a lot of sports, like Dan Papp, who's a sprint coach. Mm. He'll be like, look, when your athlete hits that first big new PR, don't try to push further. You have to give his body time to get used to that, right? The nervous system is still adapting, connected tissue bones, right? If you keep trying to push week after week after week, right? And that is in the weight room, it's a little different. And it also depends on training status. We know beginners can add weight every week and be fine. Whether they should is a different issue. Early intermediate usually can over short periods of time. Certainly as you get more advanced, the, the, the idea that you can add weight weekly, I mean, I think the idea you can add volume weekly, I don't think either of those things are probably going to happen mm. extensively. But yeah, you might be better over the short term to keep the load where it needs, because again, you're not getting stronger that quickly. Right. And it's not like even about, I, I would, I would argue that especially for isolation exercises and things like that, oh, yeah. load is less of a concern than is uh, effort. Uh, so if we're keeping, yes. you know, proximity to failure, constant set progression for these yeah. smaller muscle groups would, um, 
definitely be a viable uh, option, less oh, for yeah. compound lifts. If you're adding a set every week on squats, you're going to toast yourself. Um, Correct. But I think I agree, uh, yeah. the progression scheme is highly dependent on the uh, exercise in question. Um, and, and I think you made the good point. Repetition range will also play a very large role in that. Mm. Um, you know, let people forget. And I'm exercise is right? self-selecting to certain rep ranges as well. And that's correct. You know, typically isolation, isolation stuff is higher repetitions. If you're doing sets of 12 to 15, pretty close to limits, you know, you can whatever cut rest periods a little bit. You're just not going to be putting weight on there that quickly. And as long as the end, you're usually doing that secondary to a compound movement anyway. And this gets into a whole separate issue, right? Because the, the big thing, and, and this is kind of a separate topic, it's in the article. My big thing for years has been, we can't measure tension. This is all great in a sort of uh, hypo, you know, sort of a discussion sense. We can't, we're going to, within 10 years, somebody will have an app, right? They'll have a little EMG patch and we'll be able to figure it out individually. But we have load on the bar and that's kind of the best we've got. And in premise, a 120 by five in the squat is more tension than 100 by five, assuming technique stays the same in depth and yada, yada assuming all things equal. The problem then becomes, okay, we have practical issues of adding weight to the bar. Mm -hmm. What are the weight increments we have relative to the poundages, right? To add five pounds to 200 pound squat is two and a half percent. To add five pounds to a 40 pound lateral raise <laughs> is, a, is, oh, is 12 and a half percent. That's a big lateral raise. Show us your delts, huh? Lyle. Show me your For delts. 40 pounds, that's a, that's a strong lateral rate. I'm talking about me. I've, I've had a female <laughs> training. You did 45 for percent. I, had a, I do like I had what, a what's 12 kilos? I don't fucking even work in pounds. What's 12 kilos? Oh, 25 pounds. Yeah, that's what I do. No, a 40 pounds. I'm talking about 40. Yeah, 40 pounds is like 18 I'm just kilos. taking the piss. Oh, God, oh God no. Um, but yeah, I had a little short monster training partner. He was doing semi-strict yeah. mm. lateral raises with like 45 kilos. But I mean, he was a beast. He was just yeah. a he is five five and two twenty. He's a giant of a man, but um, yeah. So we do get into practical issues there, and like, but what people forget is okay. Let's say you've got a workout and you do compound shoulder exercise, whatever it is. Probably, you know, you've got access to the hammer overhead press, which is one of my favorite machines, mm. right? You've been doing oh, it doesn't even matter. Let's say you've been doing ninety kilos total for set of eight, and then you follow that up with lateral raises with twenty kilo dumbbells, right? So you now you increase the weight on the overhead press, right? You go to 95 kilos. Yes, that's going to detriment the lateral raise. Right, and you get to the lateral raise, and people ask me all the time, should I try to drive up the isolation movements? Now, in theory, yes. However, you're coming into it more fatigued. That same 20 kilos may actually, could potentially be a larger stimulus than it was because the delts are more fatigued to begin with, right? If you're coming into an exercise with more fatigue, that same load will will be a maximum sooner, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, just because your, your strength potential is, if your strength potential is down by 10%, that same load is now effectively 10% harder than if you, you know, it's why, try it. Do overhead presses and then laterals, and then do the laterals first in the workout, and you'll be able to do 10% more. So if the load is going up on the overhead press, you may not even really in practice need to increase mm -hmm. the laterals because they are, they are becoming more challenging more by fatigue. Yep. By sheer dint of being done later in the workout because they're under more fatigue, which is nice because practically it's just a pain to add weight to them. And, and that's true of a lot of isolation movements. Um, so, which, so again, like I said, if you sort of pick, you know, what you think of as an optimal volume, you know, and I, and I know we're kind of getting some data that, you know, is like, okay, there's a per workout maximum in terms, and this is what I want to really see, right? The only paper I've seen is by, on humans is by Birdie he compared one set of an exercise to three. Three had a higher protein synthesis response. Well, no joke. What happens at six sets per exercise? What happens at nine? Now, one, pe one thing people need to remember when they do these studies, they usually use the end point of muscle failure. Not because muscle failure is inherently good, bad, or indifferent, which it can be under given. We're it's because that, that provides an objective end point, yeah. right? This is simply a control issue for studies. If you're gonna try to compare sets to one another, they need to be taken to these, and RPE and RIR and RTF and stuff are all useful, assuming the person's any good at estimating them to begin with, but it's still, it leaves a little wiggle room. I think that's right? where so, people often forget that uh, there's true mechanical failure, then there's volitional interruption, right? Um, yeah. They, they often times uh, ignore the fact that people cut a set short um, because they perceive the fatigue to be higher than what it Correct. actually is, which impairs their 
ability to gauge where uh, true failure lies. Sure. And, and that's something that, you know, and they've even shown that with athletes, right? We've been had this 10 year thing that fatigue is all in the brain. Okay. It's not, it's not all in the brain, but it is a large part in the brain. And there is a difference. Some athletes can hurt better than others. Mm -hmm. trainees some training and i think the good athletes the successful ones they they either they know or they learn how to hurt over mm -hmm. time right so if i took a beginner and i took an advanced training and i said i want you to do a leg press to failure the beginner is going to quit mm -hmm. voluntarily because they don't and i'm not saying they're they're beginners whereas an advanced guy I might have to pull him off the machine before he hurts himself yeah. because he has learned and time there's so there's that whole it's like the psychosocial model of pain mm -hmm. there's a very, social very lot of overlap very yes very much so and it's the same sort of thing there is we've got the peripheral pathways we've got how your brain is wired in neurochemistry but we've also got that learned aspect and mm -hmm. I think successful that you learn to push through the pain you learn That's why a lot of good bodybuilders uh, generally come from an athletic background of sprinting, yes. you know, playing contact sports, all those sorts of things. Same, same thing. I've seen a lot of novice powerlifters who are very good. They come from that. They know how to compete mm. and learn and compete. Totally. That is, that is a skill. skill. Pushing through pain is a skill. And this is why I still, and I'll, I'll say this about any study. Anytime I really go, Oh, we did sets of squats to failure. Oh, bullshit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Because I mean, I've done it. I used to do when I was younger. I was big into the hard game, very low volume to failure. I've seen, I've seen people miss a rep, but seen people volunteer. And here's how I'm defining a set of squats to failure, pushing through rep after rep after rep till it gets so grindy that you barely make it to where you descend, try to come up and either get stuck in the mm -hmm. middle or have to dump the bar or need a spot. I guarantee Dangerous you. Dangerous either way. <laughs> Oh, it is. I'm not saying to do yeah, it. I'm just making yeah, yeah. the point. I yeah. see somebody say, oh, we did two sets of 15 to failure. Show me. Because I've seen sets. To, I've done sets to that level where you get stuck in the bottom. And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about a missed single or when something goes awry. I'm like to put that kind of physical effort into it. Mm -hmm. And that even ties in with the tension thing in terms of if we're doing complex compounds, can we get the same number of effective reps versus a machine, right? Mm -hmm. If I put somebody on squats and say, we're gonna do a heavy set of eight, it's probably a 10 or 12 RM mm -hmm. because that's the safer way to do it. Whereas I can put you on the leg press and I can, trust me, I can talk you through that set till it will not move. And the difference is you're not gonna die on the leg mm -hmm. press. Safe. I mean, totally. I mean, there's, there's also other that, factors like uh, central fatigue and, uh, stability sure. requirements and all those limited things. muscle factors and yeah, that's totally. and I, I think we'll probably get into that as sort of maybe exercise selection well, we've gotten way off topic so the again the question became you know oh so anyway the this the set count like okay let's say we so let's say they find that okay eight sets per workout is the average optimal right below that we're not getting the maximal response but above that we're not getting any further response mm -hmm. well like we talked about early on what does that mean mm. right is eight sets of 10 the same as eight sets of eight, right? I know there's a paper out there that's like, ah, as long as it's between 10 and 20 reps, it's all about the same. I agree-ish with that. It's neither here nor there. But what people have to remember is these are based on studies or data from sets taken generally to failure, right? So by definition, this is setting that maximal, you're reaching some number of effective repetitions or hypertrophic repetitions or whatever you want to call it. Now we know again on a set of eight, you'll get almost you know, close to eight reps of that set. Maybe let's call it five. Just, just eight, to be these are repetition maxes, correct? Right. So if you do a max set of eight, right, the, where you could not do a ninth repetition, so it's probably 80% of maximum, you might not get full recruitment, right? You know, it's, it's that 80, 90% range. But let's say you get five effective repetitions, right? That's effectively the same as doing a set of 15 to failure where you're going to get 75% yeah. of max, you're getting the same five. You can do 35 to failure, same five. So in that sense, you could compare the number of sets, I suppose, um, which also that gets into separate issue. I forgot to do this in the article, right? So we know that, let's say that 85% is the true cutoff, right? That five. Because I wrote an article about 10 years ago, and I posited the question, if you had to pick one rep range for maximum growth, what would it be? And if you ask most people I talk to, we go, ah, five to eight, right? That's where bodybuilders mm. tend to live. And that's because you are maximizing recruitment and the, the number of effective reps per set, right? Mm -hmm. Now, then we get into the stuff somebody asked me in my group, well, what, could you do it with triples? 
right? Can you just do endless triples? Well, you could, but you, it takes forever, mm -hmm. right? So, so five Pragmatic sets. Of five, let's say five sets of five, right? Twenty-five effective repetitions, right? The classic five by five. You'd have to do eight by three rep max to uh, to get those twenty-four effective. Rep Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. You'll be in the gym all day, and realistically, you will break. Mm -hmm. Or you could do three by eight RM and probably get, or maybe four by eight RM mm -hmm. and get pretty damn close. Or you could be, you know, and, and, and I think what you find is when you start adding all this up, if you're looking at sets relatively close to failure and you look at empirically, five by five, four by eight, three by 15, you're getting about the same number of effective reps per workout, kind of no matter how you cut it. And mm -hmm. I still predict, and we'll see if I'm right. I bet when all this washes out, the old Wernbaum review from over a decade ago, it's going to be about 40 to 70 total repetitions because he was looking at a high intensity in a certain intensity range, and most of those set workouts were probably to failure, and it was probably getting about the same number, you know, and there's multiple ways to do it. You can do it with straight sets. You can do it with, like, dog crap training. I still, honestly, I think part of the reason the 20-rep squat works, it's just an early rest pause. Right, you do that first set of ten, which is near limit. You get full activation. You're resting three breaths between reps. You're just getting in that one murderous set. You're getting, you know, the same twelve, thirteen, fourteen effective repetitions that you might get from doing four sets of eight with a ten RM. Mile reps and dog crap. You go to that eight RM. I think Blade uses a speed cutoff. He used to. Dog crap says go to failure. Right, so you get full activation by the end of that set. You rest just long enough to get a few more reps, mm. but without the body having so those next two to three are all effective reps in that, That's where things like clusters, Maya reps, drop sets all have, yes. uh, I guess, uh, a role uh, in a training program because they're very time efficient means of uh, achieving yes. uh, the stimulus. So uh, that leads me on to very the next question because so. we've we've started to talk a little bit about training to failure, and I think yeah. uh, it's important to sort of have the listeners understand that getting to true uh, mechanical failure um, is not always a good idea. And we had a recent paper come out that showed that um, advanced athletes trained to failure uh, actually saw, you know, decrements in performance or, in, you know, less high. Oh, no, I have no doubt. Yeah. Um, which is not at all surprising. Um, but what I guess do you think people should know uh, about training to failure and the implications of going to failure on one set on your ability to achieve, you know, the total number of effective reps, when is failure appropriate? When is it not? Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's another consideration, you know, as far as going to muscular fear. So first let's define it because I, there are multiple definitions. There's a really tedious paper. I'll send you the link to that uh, James Fisher and Steele did. And it's like looking at the definitions of failure over the last three decades. It's just, mm. I mean, it's interesting, but it's just boring as all hell. Man, the, way they the, way they, the way they define failure is an inability to complete the repetition regardless of the amount of effort given. And this is a very specific set of wording, mm. right? So you're doing a bicep curl, right? Full range bicep curl. You hit the middle, which is typically the sticking point. And no matter how hard you put, how hard you pull, excuse me, you cannot complete the repetition, right? That is true you know, mechanical failure. And like you said, volitional failure is a very different thing. That's when you stop because it got a little technical bit Technical failure. Right, there could be technical failure where your technique starts to change. I think that's more of an issue for beginners than advanced. Yeah. I think when you get advanced well, even, even guys, like uh, Even, you know, using inertia, momentum. Um, sure, starting that, that to throw the bar. The tension. Yes. Um, on the muscle, all those sorts of changes at the moment. That gets, more that gets more complicated. And that's another big article about physics is – does the whole thing. Okay, so this is going to get – I'm going to get real complicated for a second. I'll go back to the actual question. Okay, so any weight training movement has to start and stop at a zero velocity, right, by definition, mm -hmm. right? Unless you throw the bar, you have to stop. When a bench press starts at zero, stops at zero. And what you see if you, if you graph force by time – Right, it goes up as you accelerate, but you have to decelerate at the top because if you don't, you lock your right, you smash right. your elbows, and that's probably that's been the part of the problem with power training in the weight room. Squats do not lend themselves to true power training because you have to ease up at the top. I mean, unless you jump, 
right? Jump squats. If you let the bar go, uh, Australian Institute of Sport years ago, they, they had, they had a device. They had the special, it's like a Smith machine on a, a motorized Smith machine and you would jump and let go of the bar and it would stop the bar from landing on you. So you could do a bench press throw. I don't recommend that in your local goals because yes, you get to accelerate to the top. You have a bigger issue, which is catching the bar that is now going to land on you. Right? So there's a whole set of issues. So by definition, you have to start and stop at zero. Now, so let's say you kind of ease out of the bottom, right? You squeeze it, nice isotension, whatever you want to call it. Right? So, but the, 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 the generic force time curve is going to be acceleration, deceleration to zero, right? And the sticking point is kind of like that's where it gets, that's where it slows the hardest. The force demands are highest. So if you, yeah, so if you accelerate the bar, right, explosive or accelerate, you know, or throw it, right, we know by to, to get a higher acceleration, you get a huge peak force, mm. right? You get an impulse and all this physics stuff that I don't want to get into because I'll get it wrong. But then it, you have to get a big deceleration. Whereas if you use a little bit more controlled lifting speed, you will get a more even. So it's like, I think if, I think if you look at the area of the curve of total force, it's probably a high, it, it's probably similar. You're just seeing a different, if you throw it or accelerate it, you mm. get this high peak and then a big drop off. That's Whereas if you constant. keep it a little bit slower or accelerate, it's a little bit, and that might, that gets into separate issues that we're going to have time to, to deal with, right? Is that technically during any weight training movement, there's only one position of maximal tension. And that's the sticking point, right? If you do a bicep curl, it's not maximal at the bottom. It's not maximal at the top. It's maximal there. So tension is changing. And like, that's where cams came from. It was an attempt to match the force requirements to the movement itself. If you look at what powerlifters do with bands and chains, you know, you can partial squat the world and full squat a lot less than the world, right? If you can get through the middle, you probably get to the top. But that means that at the top, your muscles are not under maximal tension. And this gets, you know, so they use bands and chains to overload the top position. It's a gear thing and other stuff. But I do think that lends some credence to the old bodybuilder idea. Of it, by altering the movement you pick, you can change the position of maximal tension. And like, I know it's trendy. Through machines. Yeah, or at least by like using that. different exercises. So you can, yeah. you know, you can maximal tension at the bottom, middle, you know, whether it matters, the big picture, six, one, don't know. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I know it's trendy to kind of crap on bro science, but the bodybuilders were not all idiots, right? They, they figured out a lot sort of empirically. And so changing exercises, you can change where in the movement biomechanically the point of maximum tension is. But anyway, uh, what were we talking about before I got off on this monster question about the physics? Oh, right. So training to failure, right? So assuming, thank you, maintain form, you know, you don't start heaving the bar, whatever. When you reach the point that no matter how much effort you put in, you cannot complete, okay, that's the definition of failure. Now, the HIT guys have always been of the, oh, uh, you can't know how hard you're working um, if you don't go to failure. And that's obviously BS. We know with mm -hmm. RPE, you know, reps and reserve reps to failure, that's obviously untrue. That takes training. There's a paper I've got, uh, again, by Steele and Fisher. And they found that from beginner to advanced, they would ask them, how many reps do you think you can do to failure? And then they take them, and beginners are nowhere close. They're like at least four or five reps off on average. And as you get more well-trained, you're much more aware of it, mm -hmm. right? Because you've learned over time. And you can tell by bar speed, right? If every rep, boom, 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 I'm done, you weren't even close. When you're about three reps short of failure, that fast rep speed, starts to slow down and then it starts to slow down and then that last rep will barely make it through mm -hmm. and then you might get another one if you're you've got grind for days but your question was how does failure impact the rest of the workout and the answer is enormously potentially right so let's say you're doing four sets and you're like all right i'm gonna take the first set to fit true failure and your goal was four sets of eight, and you take that thing to true limits. If you try to keep the same weight on the bar, you're probably going to get five or six reps on the second set. And if you take that to fail, you're going to get two or three. Like you're, without adjusting the weight down enormously, your repetitions will fall off at a staggering rate. Mm -hmm. Right? This is why strength power athletes don't usually of go to reps, right? 
you may actually end up getting less in the big picture than if you kept it because you can you can generally do a higher per workout volume or per exercise volume by keeping a rep or two in the tank mm -hmm. right now how i've typically programmed mainly for intermediates like if you're gonna do four sets of eight i will typically say i want you to start about two with two to three reps in reserve right it should be about a 10 or 11 rep max now you'll get a few effective reps you rest 90 seconds to two minutes on that next set because of fatigue, you will probably be one to two reps in reserve, mm -hmm. right? You're a little more tired coming in. You, you know, maybe you rest five minutes, you might get the same eight without any really cumulative fatigue. By the third set, you're probably one rep from failure, and that fourth set may mm -hmm. be to failure. Now, if you already low volume, right, there's guys that do it. Martin Birkin tends to be sort of a low volume reverse pyramid training, right? If you only want to do two or three sets, by all means, and it's not an exercise you can safely do it, then, then going to failure may be very effective, right? Dog crap training, which is you take the set to failure and then do these two or three mini sets and occasionally mm -hmm. do two exercises. You can do that, but you're only doing two set, two, two work sets. Like it's, it's a little misleading here, right? Because obviously that mire, that, that dog crap, that rest pause set where you do a set to failure, eight, three, two, one, is not the equivalent of one set not to failure, Correct. right? It's maybe the effective equivalent of three well, works. It's, well, it's got more sets. effective reps, and that's what we said right. is probably the best way to look at volume, sure. not how many and, sets, but how many right. effective reps, and then the exactly. implications of going and, and, to true failure has on uh, exactly. your, your um, training workout. If you're doing straight sets and you're doing 10 yes. of them, you've got a failure on the first, very different to do it in failure on the first, sure. and then you know a Meyer rep sure. or dog crap style training. Right. And that's just, and it's a difference in volume. It's like you can do whatever four sets of eight mm -hmm. and start with a couple reps left in the tank and you're going to gradually fatigue and be close to limits at the end. Or you can do that one really murderous set or two very murderous sets, you know, and, and it's interesting because Dante's whole philosophy um, of that is he wanted to generate the maximal stimulus with the minimal mi minimum work, right? Mm -hmm. His, his idea, and I think there's something to this, the volume is, is generating just fatigue, the more volume that you do. You want the maximal hypertrophic stimulus with the least amount of work. And so he, he you know, but again, not everybody, some movements don't lend themselves to that. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't do them on RDLs. Very bad idea. He doesn't do them. Well, they do widow makers. They do 20 rep squats. But there are some exercises that going, that kind of training is very unsafe, mm -hmm. right? Machines fantastic you want to go on a hammer incline press cable rows stuff where you're not going to get hurt if your form breaks and there's also you know training status you have to be able to maintain form under fatigue you know so so in many cases and, and we're not saying there's two extremes right it's not like ah do you take you I mean you can you can do 10 piss ass sets where you get one effective rep per set or you can do four by eight you know so you get 10 effective reps you do four by eight a little closer to failure you're going to get you know whatever three three two Both. one which yeah. is about 10 reps you, can do, so, yeah. you know in that range if you do two exercises you get about 12 you can do a dog crap or a Meyer rep set and you're going to get you know five three two one and get that 11 and it's kind of all, all same parts. you know it, it kind of gets you i heard uh written on the internet yeah. somewhere <laughs> Uh, yes, and that's and that's kind of it. Like at the end of the yeah. day, it, these are different ways to get there, and there may be better or you know better or worse reasons to do it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, again, getting really strength power athletes different goal. They will frequently deliberately stay short of failure because they can do more volume, right? And they There's can the do more quality as volume. Well. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Sure. Right. Because a power lifter needs to do rather than doing three sets of five where the last three reps of their squat set is just garbage, mm -hmm. they're better off doing eight sets of two and getting two perfect reps mm -hmm. or you know matt gary is a u.s apl power apparently the u.s has a powerlifting team this is mm -hmm. news to me um you know he does deadlift singles because you start mm -hmm. deadlifts off the floor and he wants perfect setups the specificity he wants a perfect, is a lot more important for strength the, goals than it is for hypertrophy. correct right so absolutely Lyle, hypertrophy uh, is a completely different thing Awesome, uh, it just this is just I mean like you brought up so many things tangentially and it's a good thing you shut me up before I got off on like yeah, so I was the just whole to keep like, things stability. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. No, it's good. It's better because otherwise I talk for forty five minutes and don't ever get to the point. But like I do think there's interesting stuff to talk about. Like for hypertrophy, I will maintain the machines are better than free weights because it takes the stability. Like what are you trying? Uh, uh, stabilizers. I'm sorry, I don't really give a shit if greater my super stability, status, greater force you know, potential. I, 
Correct. You know, or I think there's even if you wanted to get into, you know, length tension curves and, and uh, lever arms, right, in a very logical sense, if your goal is to train the pecs to do a machine bottom range, then fuck the, fuck the lockout. That's all you're doing there is letting your triceps limit your pecs. Like, I think there is some logic to simply doing the first half to the sticking point to work the pecs maximally. Um, so uh, I guess uh, that's all I have time for for this one. I would love to get you back uh, for oh, okay. part two shortly because uh, I think there's a lot more Absolutely. to discuss and pick apart here. It's been a really productive chat, I think, and there's a lot to uh, take, take out of this one. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. I'll be sure to link everybody to those articles. Uh, do read them, guys. They're, they're very informative. Yep. And uh, I'll speak to you soon, Lyle. Fantastic. Thanks, Jacob. Easy, man. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, I will yeah. flick you a message. We'll tee up another time because I think there's a lot else uh, we can yeah. sort of get into. That was really good. Very good.